Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lindsay Humphreys, and I'm the Program Director for Junior Achievement of New Mexico. You are joining us today for our Inspiring NM Student Conference, and thank you to the New Mexico Society of CPAs, who has partnered with Junior Achievement to make this amazing conference possible. You are in our last week. We've had an amazing time, and we're so excited for you to be joining us today. And our speakers are going to be sharing details about their education, their jobs, and their career journey, as well as be con conquering some very valuable skills and concepts for your own future economic success. So before we get started, just a few virtual meeting etiquette reminders. This video will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, so make sure you send that link to anybody in your network that would enjoy this presentation. And then at this time, if you could please type your first and last name into the chat box, that'll just let us know how many students we have on the call with us today. And if you're an educator or a parent presenting this to your students, please just let us know how many students you have on the call with you as well. Please remember that the, during the speaker's presentation, we would like all of our mics to be muted. And if the questions come, up, come up during the presentation, please feel free to jot them into the chat box and I'll facilitate that during the Q&A portion of the event. Today, we are so ex excited to welcome New Mexico State Treasurer, Tim Eichenberg. We are honored and thrilled to have him share his story with you all today. Treasurer Eichenberg, I'll share my screen and the floor is yours. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And um, just a, a quick shout out and an apology to the listening audience. And that's the big Band-Aid on my nose. I could come up with some great stories as to how it happened. However, I just tripped over my dog. And unfortunately, the way the leash was tied around the dog and myself, I wound up on the sidewalk face first. And so I've tried to cover it up. And if there's any teenagers listening, you've all uh, awakened in the morning with that pimple on your nose. And now you know how I feel um, with this great big bandage on mine. So I put on this tie and I put it with polka dots so that you would all be looking at the tie and not the bandage on my nose. Today, I get the distinct honor and, and truly a pleasure to just be able to share with you job benefits um, and why I feel it's more than just a salary. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. I grew up in Albuquerque. I've lived here in Albuquerque my entire life. I grew up with a military family. My father was stationed at Holloman Air Force Base down in Alamogordo, but he put this family in Albuquerque because I had three brothers and three sisters. And so there was a large family and he wanted us in a larger community. I. Uh, attended Manzano High School. And I don't know how many of you kids out there have grandparents that are probably my age now that went to high school here in Albuquerque, but I attended Manzano. And I had my first job and that's, I wanna talk about my first benefit. I had my first job when I was about eight, nine, 10 years old. I wish I could remember that far back, but this was related to me by my mother several times. And I remember doing it, but my first job with benefits was ironing. I used to take the military shirts of my dad's and several other officers that lived on the same street as we lived on. And on Sundays, I would iron their shirts. A little bit of starch, lots of heat, but they always were crisp and nice. But the benefit that I got from it, not only the 25 cents a shirt, but also the fact that I could watch TV. We weren't allowed to watch TV. Back then they were only black and white, but I got to watch Dallas Cowboy football. So on Sundays during football season, I could sit and watch television and iron and earn money. Now my mother worked for a savings and loan company right there on Wyoming Boulevard, where we close to where our home was. And she had a slogan, pay yourself first. So every time I made money, whether it was ironing raking leaves, washing a car, um, just being a, a nice person, helping some sweet little old lady or man with what are the, their yard work, whatever money I earned, 10% of that, that was kind of the, the parameter, 10% of our money went into the savings account as soon as we earned it. And it was called pay yourself first. And that's what I've always done. I pay myself first. 
And that's what, what we are going to work towards eventually, which is the 401k. My second job was sweeping a strip mall there on Wyoming. And it had a pharmacy and a little grocery store and a liquor store and a whole bunch of other, just strip mall. But I got paid a dollar a store per week. And the flexibility there, the benefit there, was I had to do it once a day. Pick up the trash in the parking lot and sweep the sidewalk. It didn't matter if I did it at 8 o'clock in the morning or at 9 o'clock at night. The benefit was, to me, that I could do it either before school or after school. But I had to do it before the pharmacy closed because the benefit there was he provided the broom and he provided the storage for the broom. So I never had to take it to and from the home. So that was my second job. And again, when I got paid every Saturday morning, my 10% went to my savings account. So that's how I got started. That's how I got trained to put money away for retirement, that, that long-term savings account. After I um, graduated from Manzano High School and started at the University of New Mexico and was working part-time at the state at the Bernalillo County Treasurer's Office. And it was there that I decided to run for county treasurer. I just got frustrated with the amount of work that people weren't doing and the amount of work that overworked people were doing. And so when the administration was just going to go from the deputy to the, to the current treasurer, I felt that I should run, and I did run, and I did win. So if you know anything about elections, the strangest people win them sometimes, and I was one that did. I was successful. I was 22 years of age at the time and the Bernalillo County Treasurer. I did that job, and I learned a new benefit. And in that particular benefit, it was called a defined benefit because I knew exactly when I started, if I put the amount of money that the county required into the PARA, that's the Public Employees Retirement Association, the county matched it. And that would be for my long-term benefit of 3% per year for each year that I worked in PARA. So that was a defined benefit. I knew exactly how much I would have at retirement. And so that's something I would con I would actually encourage you as students that if you want to go to college and you want benefits like a defined benefit for your retirement, look at city or county or state government. They're wonderful for that kind of a defined benefit. And they also have other things that I didn't take advantage of, but I've asked my employees here to take advantage of, and that's tuition reimbursement. If you want to go to college and study in that particular field that you're working in, they will reimburse your tuition. And I've got my assistant moving um, my screen here. Um, let's uh, jump to that next slide, Julie, if you would. Um, just a little bit about what the state treasurer's office before I go back to how I actually got to be state treasurer, because my path to this career change was kind of unusual. Um, but I'm one of seven statewide elected officials. We've all heard of the governor. She's in the newspaper or on the news almost every day. And then there's the lieutenant governor, and then there's the state treasurer. And you've had some of the guest speakers already, which is Hector Balderas, our attorney general. And so um, that's what we do statewide. Um, after I left the treasurer's office, I went to work for my mother and father. They were real estate brokers in Albuquerque. Uh, my mother was a broker as well as my father. And they sold real estate. They sold homes to people looking for homes, just like your mother and fathers probably have done in the past. And so um, I enjoyed that. And the benefit that I liked most about it was because when I was county treasurer, I was the first one to work at seven o'clock in the morning, but I was also the last one to leave work at six or seven o'clock in the evening. And then Saturdays, because it was an elective office, I had to do partisan political activity. So I enjoyed going to work for my mom and my dad because the hours were quite flexible. And that's a benefit, flexible hours. I didn't show up to work until sometimes noon because in the morning, I might take a walk or go play golf. And it didn't matter that I didn't show up till noon. The, how hard I worked 
depending on how much money I made. So I worked for my mom and my dad. And when I heard the term SOB, and I'm sure some of you have heard that term SOB, I used to just kind of puff up a little bit because I always thought it meant son of a broker. And I was one, so I was proud to be called an SOB. Um, from there, um, real estate requires continuing education. So every year you have to take a minimum of 14 hours for an accumulation of 42 hours over a three year period of time. And that's more detail than you need. But because of the education that was required, I branched out, not just real estate, because it kind of got boring after a while, the same classes. So I went into appraising and from appraising into real estate construction, both of them helped. And so I got licenses in both. I have a license as a GB98, meaning a general contractor, but I also got a license as a residential appraiser. And from residential appraiser, and I did that for years, but from there, I went into what are called property tax protests. And I just did that, started that about 30 years ago, 35 years ago. And um, so I was already midlife. I was off pushing 40 years of age when I went into revaluation protests. And what that means is that the county assessor sends out an assessment every note, every um, April to your homeowner or to your real estate um, commercial building owner. They send out an assessment to collect property taxes. And they do them by computer. So the error margin, what we call the coefficient of dispersion, can be all over the street. And so what I would do is review those assessments. And if they were high, I would file a protest on the owner's behalf. And that's how I would collect a fee. Well, I got to be known as quite an expert in, re in that real estate area of valuation protests. And so Governor Bill Richardson, when he got elected governor, he was looking for a property tax director that worked in the tax and rev department. And so my name came up. He actually called to interview me. Um, I was kind of caught off guard by the ask. And so when they said, could you come up this afternoon? I said, no, um, I'm actually on the golf course right now. And um, you've also asked for a resume and I've never written a resume. So could I do it tomorrow? And they postponed my appointment for the next day. And so I got off the golf course and I went home and I got on the computer to find out what does the property tax director do? Now I had a feeling already because I worked in valuation protests and he oversaw assessors, but I looked at all the other things that they did. And so I drafted my resume to fit that kind of criteria and showed up the next morning for an interview as the property tax director for the state of New Mexico. Uh, interesting question and answer. I didn't know anything about benefits. I didn't ask about them, but it was a Jeopardy type question. What does this mean in property tax? I knew the answer and I knew he, by his body language that he found the right person that he wanted for the job. And so I felt very comfortable that now I could just be open and honest and probably get the job. And sure enough, I was offered the job a couple of days later. Property taxes are something that funds our, our public schools. And most people don't know that, but your school is bonded by the value of property taxes in your county. Well, a state senator who represented my area in Albuquerque was proposing a tax break for the oil and gas industry that would have cost our schools money. So I got upset as the property tax director. I didn't like the fact that they were doing this. Their lobbying was better than ours and it passed. And so I got mad, ran against that state senator so that we wouldn't have that kind of depletion of our property tax base for our schools going forward. I spent four years as a state senator. After I left the state senate, I then went back to doing real estate and property tax protests until the state treasurer's office came up and my name surfaced as somebody that knew a little bit about government because of my Senate experience, knew a little bit about government because of property tax, 
And I was a former county treasurer in the largest county by population in the state of New Mexico, which gave me an edge running for state treasurer. So I ran for state treasurer. I'm currently in my second term. I have um, one year, seven months, 25 days, and six hours left of my term in office. And um, I still call it my term and not my sentence, but um, for you that out there that know how hard it is to work a challenging job, um, sometimes the two of them get kind of confusing. So let me now, I've shown you my path. Um, let me tell you what the treasurer's office does, essentially. Um, we're the state's bank. So I'm basically the president of the bank. I've got a great staff. They do a lot of work for me. Um, we invest money for our local governments, our local tribes, and um, our universities, and our own bank accounts here at the state treasurer's office. And we earn interest on that money, and that goes into the general fund. And last year, we earned an interest $170 million of your taxpayers' money that had not been dispersed waiting for the budgets to catch up. So that money went into tax savings to you. But that's interest that we want to talk about. Some of the special programs, and thank you, Lindsay, for the opportunity for me to talk about these. Um, uh, and we'll just pick the first one, which is ABLE. And I have Heather Benavides, who is my program director for ABLE. And that stands for a better life experience with people with disabilities. So I'm reaching out to everyone out there that may know somebody to listen to this particular part of the program. And Heather, would you take that and, and tell us just a little bit about what we do for the ABLE program here in New Mexico? Certainly, Treasurer, thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. And it's a law that allows individuals with disabilities to save money. Now, we probably all know somebody living with a disability, but what we don't all know is that if that person is receiving public benefits, then they can never have more than $2,000 in their name without risking their eligibility. But all that has changed now with the ABLE Act, and here in New Mexico, we launched our program, ABLE New Mexico, in 2018. They are online accounts, and there are specific eligibility requirements, but we encourage you to go to ablenewmexico.com to see if you or somebody you know is eligible to have an account so that you can save money, spend money, invest your money, and live independently in charge of your own finances. And so as the treasurer was talking about earlier, this is a benefit that individuals with disabilities can now enjoy. And I will make sure that Lindsay gets all of the documentation and sends you the link. And thank you, Treasurer. Is there anything I missed? Thank you, Heather. Thank you for being here this morning. And thank you, Lindsay, for my, my unpaid advertisement, so to speak. I appreciate that. Um, what you asked me to do today was about benefits. And I tried to sh share with the audience a little bit about the flexibility of what a benefit really is. With me, when it started at the age of 10, it allowed me to watch TV. Um, at the age of, of 12 and 14, while I was going to junior high school, it allowed me to either do my job before school or after school. These are the flexible things a benefit should provide a wage earner. So don't always look at the salary that you get as the most important thing. Look at the flexibility. These are just some of the job benefits that we have here on, on, on the screen now um, that are out there and available. And they're just some of them. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I kind of briefly talked about a defined benefit, which is what the state of New Mexico offers me in the, in the job that I am in. But if your teacher is sitting there, the state of New Mexico also offers your teacher a defined benefit through the Educational Retirement Association they get a percentage of uh, a ratio percentage of each year that they work in their profession, that's going to be a defined benefit to them when they retire. But they do the work not for the retirement. I don't think anybody actually does the work for the retirement. They do it for the satisfaction of doing the job. And that is a benefit that we take with us everywhere we go. And that's the pride that we have. And so if your teacher's sitting there with you, I hope that you'll just kind of 
say thank you because they are truly frontline people doing so much for us. Now I've shown you those, but I wanna go into some more specifics about a few of them. And I'm gonna use examples like myself, but my two children. I have two children and they took totally different career paths and have totally different path, um, benefits because of it. My daughter got her master's degree in social work. She works for hospice. She is a mother of two small children. And um, what she was looking for was not only the satisfaction of helping other people, um, but also being able to raise a family. So when she went in and negotiated benefits, whether it was a 401k, because they had that, and that's a retirement package for people that um, don't have a defined benefit. It's called a 401. Okay, and that's actually named after the federal statute um, and the regulation. It's 401k. Um, you want to go to a federal, um, the federal documents to look that up. She gets a match in her 401k. Her employer only gives her 1%. She puts in six for her savings long term towards her retirement, but her employer only gives her one. But what the employer tries to do to make up for that was gave her more vacation so that she would be more flexible in her students, her children's classrooms and what they did. So she could leave work early to catch the swim uh, practice or the swim meet or the soccer practice or just being at home with the kids if they had a bad day at school. And then in the evenings, she would get back on the computer after their bath and their bedtime. She could get on the computer and then do her login and her briefs on each one of the patients she saw. So she could break up her work schedule, some in the morning, some in the afternoon, some in the evening. Uh, it was just a great thing for her. Um, one of the other benefits that she had in this particular type of job was her paycheck was every two weeks and it was a constant paycheck. It was the same amount of money every two weeks, 26 paychecks a year, and she always knew what that was going to be. Um, she had benefits of time off, like I said, the vacation, but she also earned sick leave, that allowed her five days of sick leave each year, and she had holidays. She was only given six holidays. I think in state government, we have 11, if I'm correct, but she only got six, but she could define them. So if she wanted Christmas and, and um, Thanksgiving, those were her first two picks usually, and then New Year's, but she could give up Memorial Day for the day after Thanksgiving so she could have a long weekend. So those were some of the benefits that she had there. Now, the, the difficulty of the job, because she is salaried, um, was that she supervised people. And that supervision then would give her the opportunity to become a higher boss. So those are the, the kind of things that you have to weigh in your benefits package. Do you want that path to success where you're gonna be the president of the company or do you wanna stay in middle management? Those kind of things you determine for yourself. And I can only tell you why I like being the boss because if I have a path that I want people to go in, I can lead that way. But there's others that would rather stop where they are, and that's okay, as long as the benefits are what you want out of it. The other person that I wanna talk about is my son. He left college early. He went to work for, and if you don't mind the plug, I'm gonna throw it in here. He went to work for Southwest Airlines, and he loves it. He's been there now over 15 years, and he has um, hourly wage. He doesn't get a, a specific paycheck every two weeks. He gets paid once a month. And he gets paid once a month based on how much time he spends in the air. So that when they lock the door on that plane, that's when his pay starts. So sitting in the airport doesn't get him paid. It's in the plane. But he has overtime compensation. So if he works more than what he's required to do, he gets paid overtime. And he gets the benefit of working a holiday, like Christmas or New Year's or Thanksgiving. He would get double time for those. 
And because he was single right out of, I mean, he hadn't finished college, he loved working those holidays. He messed up his mom and dad's holiday because we never had Christmas on Christmas because he was always working. But we took it as he felt that the mothers that were airline um, attendants, they could be home with their family if he volunteered to work their shifts. And so he did that. But his benefit was double time in which to do it. Um, the other thing was flexible hours. And in interviewing my son about some of the things that he's done, of course, I've had these interviews for 15 years with him. Um, but one of the other benefits is he flies free. No matter where he goes on Southwest Airline, he flies free. And he flies at literally a reduced amount um, when he's flying another airline. So he had a friend from when he was just a small uh, child at the age of six, he met this young man. And they grew up being friends because we lived, lived down the street from each other. He had an opportunity to go to Australia to do a research project for his university. Andrew goes, well, gee, if he's got a free hotel where he's living, I can go down and hang out and it won't cost me anything. Well, that airline ticket to Australia cost him something like $150 because he had that status with the other airline. So he had the flexibility, number one, well, I just don't have to work for those three weeks for Southwest because he had that flexibility. If he didn't work, he just didn't get paid, but he also got to go do that. So, um, and that's a benefit that I enjoy that my son has, which is parents, um, because they are a union, um, Southwest Airlines, they negotiated that parents of employees also fly free. So, I used to just jump on a plane and go to Phoenix to play golf during January and February here in Albuquerque because I could fly over and fly back the same day. And it didn't cost me anything to get on that plane. The only kicker is, is that you're flying standby. And if the plane gets full, they kick me off. Um, the other differences here on the benefits especially is, and I talked about this just a little bit with my daughter, but as a salaried employee and working her way up the ladder and perhaps maybe becoming the boss someday, she had the, the, the con, so to speak, on this, the detriment was potentially long hours for the same amount of money. Um, and it was, again, some of the less choices. If somebody that she was supervising called in sick, that job still had to be done. So there was my daughter that had to step in to do that kind of work. So um, until that employee returned. So again, longer hours. But the benefit that she liked was the flexibility because of her children and the guaranteed paycheck every two weeks. My son is susceptible to um, the economic conditions. We just went through a pandemic and two airlines, if you saw those in the newspapers, they laid off thousands of employees. Southwest didn't lay anybody off but what they asked you to do was take a reduced salary and not work. And so that's one of the things my son did because he has a 401k plan with Southwest and has had it for 15 years. And when he started, they had a 6% match. So if he put 6% of his salary in, the company put in 6% to match it. So he had a tremendous savings in his 401k and he could afford to take off that year. He's been off work for a year at 50% salary and the other from his savings. Um, the other detriment to working hourly is if you're tardy or late a lot, you're going to see that in your paycheck. It won't be as high and typically fewer benefits. However, that's why I'm promoting Southwest here. If you're looking for something that just takes you all over the country all the time, um, working for an airline can be a lot of fun. But um, the last thing he told me was is Southwest offers him is profit sharing. So when Southwest had a remarkable year back in 2019, he received $6,000 that went directly into his 401k. That was his share of the profit that the company made. And again, that was something that the transportation workers negotiated instead of higher salaries, better benefits. And those are the kind of things that when you start looking for your job 
and it doesn't matter what job you want to go into. Let that career path choose you as you choose it. Sometimes it snakes around a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, some people know exactly what they want to be. Um, but others, like me, I followed truly four different paths to become state treasurer. Um, there are a couple of things I want to quickly tell you because um, I'm kind of running out of time here um, is compound interest and um, it goes to the rule of 72 and I don't know how many of your students out there know the rule of 72 but just briefly um, if you put a hundred dollars in a, in a savings account and you know what the interest rate is if you divide that interest rate into 72 it'll tell you how many years before that money will double so if you put the hundred dollars in and let's say you're getting seven percent interest it's approximately 10 years that money will go from 100 dollars to 200 dollars, and 10 years later it'll go to 400 and 10 years later it'll go to 800. so just think if you were continuing to put money into that savings account not just the initial 100 and leave it but more each month how long before it doubles each time but when you look at that last number, $800, that's your money. All $800 is yours, but your only principal is 100. The other 700 is interest. And that brings me to a slide of Benjamin Franklin. And if I can read that for you, money makes money. And in the case that I just illustrated to you is a perfect example of that. You have $800 in the bank, but only 100 is yours. The other is interest. So money makes money and the money that makes money makes more money. And that's that doubling of that compound interest. And the last one I wanna quote from, cause I know everybody knows Benjamin Franklin and everybody knows George Washington and George Washington's on the $1 bill, but Ben Franklin is on the $100 bill. So that should tell you something. If you want more money, think like Ben Franklin. But uh, Albert Einstein, and we all know Albert Einstein for his theory of relativity and all the other things that he's done. But here's a quote from um, Albert Einstein on compound interest. And that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. And, and that is truly uh, very profound. You want to earn money on your money and you want to earn interest on your interest, and that's the most important things. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about is, is right here in, in my class, if I have just a few more minutes, Lindsay, um, before we take questions, is I have employees that I actually encourage them to go back to school because I have an employee that could retire before they're 50 years old. And what they'll get is that defined benefit. They'll get 80% of their current salary for the rest of their life. So if they retire before they're 50, what are they gonna do for the next 20 years? Because they're too, really too young to, to quit working. Now, I suggested go back and get an accounting degree. If you get an accounting degree, you can work your own hours. You could work during tax season, you could work during whatever, and just being a bookkeeper for somebody and work part-time, but be flexible. And so if you want children or your grandchildren. So again, it's something that I encourage people at the state of New Mexico to take advantage of tuition reimbursement. So we get back to my last slide here, which is job benefits. It's more than just a salary. And I hope that you all have thought about that. Again, my first job, yes, it was ironing, kind of a sissy kind of job to some people. But to me, it paid me $6 every week and it let me watch Dallas Cowboy football. And that was my benefit. Um, so when you're being interviewed and sometimes at Walmart, you know, you can go online and you can look at the Walmart and they'll tell you what their benefits are or the McDonald's. But if you look at government, they have a defined benefit. And the last thing I wanna leave you with is pay yourself first. The, the sooner you start saving for your retirement, and I hate to admit this, but my next birthday, I'll be 70 years old. And I'm fortunate enough that I've been saving money 
And I think that when my wife and I retire, we'll be okay as we go forward. We don't know how long we're gonna live, but if we get into our 90s, my accountant has already told me I need to die a year earlier. I need to die at 89 because that's when my money's been around. That's his joke with me. But it also gives us a retiree benefit. So my health insurance is taken care of through the retiree benefit of uh, health care. So those are things that are important to you. So you've seen three illustrations. One of a college graduate that likes the salary, a non-college graduate that likes the, uh, um, the benefits of the flex of his schedule, and then where I am at the age of 70, now retiring from the state treasurer's office. So if you remember to pay yourself first, even if it's only 1%, that too, by the time you're 70, will have grown where you can sit back and say, hey, I think I'll get a second home in London and live there. So pay yourself first. And thank you again, Lindsay, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Treasurer Eichenberg. We are going to move into the Q&A portion of the event. And so I will facilitate the chat box. So please feel free, anybody who is on the call, to type the questions into the chat. But Treasurer Eichenberg, I will start by our first question is, what is the best advice you have ever received? I think it, I think it was from my mom and my dad, which was pay yourself first. It taught me to save. And people don't understand, you don't just put it in a piggy bank, you put it into a savings and loan, or now it's credit unions, because they pay you interest. Um, then your money is making money, as Benjamin Franklin says. So I think that was the best advice. The other was, some. Um, uh, again, it was a Benjamin Franklin type thing, which is never go to bed with owing somebody money when you could pay them that day. Uh, he said, if you have to walk a mile to pay your debt, do so. And that was something that I was very conscientious about because borrowing money is not a bad thing. Um, Borrowing money to help you achieve your goal is a good thing, but remember to pay it back. So I think those two things. And boy, I hate quoting Benjamin Franklin, but the nice thing about that is he's older than I am. That's excellent advice. Thank you. Um, what would you say the easiest and hardest part of your job is? Well, it's certainly the most challenging job being state treasurer. It's, it's the most challenging job I've ever had. Um, I think it's it's the dependence that people have on you. And it's not just my staff or the staff of the state government. It's everybody in, in the state of New Mexico. They depend on me to do what's right. They depend on me to make sure that the accounts are balanced. And they depend on me to earn money. Because the more money I earn in my interest-bearing accounts, the less money they pay in taxes. And that's a heck of a responsibility, um, especially when you put $500 million, let's say, in Deutsche Bank, and then you open up the Wall Street Journal and you find that they just lost 10% of their assets due to poor performance in the European market. You wonder whether or not they're going to get my $500 million back. And so you worry about that for the next three weeks or four weeks that you made that investment. Um, so there are some sleepless nights in that job. But it's incredibly rewarding especially things like the ABLE Act, um, having it in the treasurer's office. It's pretty exciting. Thank you. Um, was there ever a time that you messed up at work or you failed? And how have you recovered? Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've messed up. Um, what I found, and, and I learned this again as a young man, um, be the first one to say that you messed up. Don't let your boss find out first. Be the one that walks in, knocks on the door and said, hey, I've made a mistake and we need to fix this. And never fib about it. Um, that is the dumbest thing in the world. We're all human beings and we all mess up. And the best thing to do is just mess up. I goofed, let's fix it and move on. And I would give that advice to anybody and everybody. It has saved me more than once. When I've got my name in the newspaper because of something I did wrong, I just said, I did it. And we've corrected it and we're moving forward. 
and then became a non-story. Yeah, and to a public figure, that means a lot. Thank you. Um, what would you say you love the most about your job? Oh, it's it's incredibly rewarding, um, especially when when you see the things that we've accomplished. I sit on lots of boards and commissions, um, one of which is the Martin Luther King Commission and the six principles that Martin Luther King has. It's fun to to expound on those out in out in out in the public. I sit on the Educational Retirement Board, so I see the I see the difficulty that our teachers go through, and every day we're there protecting their defined benefit. Um, it's, it's a wonderful job, um, able, um, and with he and what Heather does for us, we have over 750 accounts of people that are saving money and using that money for their education or their housing or transportation, because they don't have to spend that money anymore. They're allowed to save it. And that means a lot. Uh, every once in a while, you just get somebody who says, hey, I did this. And it just makes me smile when I'm walking through the grocery store and somebody has had interaction with the treasurer's office and they have something nice to say. It's just, it's comforting. And I walk through the grocery store a lot because my, my wife doesn't shop, I do it. And um, what's so fun about it is, is that because I'm an elected official and was a state senator in the neighborhood, people still think I'm their city councilor. And behind a mask, I can get away with everything and a hat now. Um, you don't even have to shave as much. It's really kind of nice. And then here today, I get, a, you know, I get a virtual meeting with a huge scabs all over my face and um, have to cover them all up. But um, I do have my mask right here. It'll go on afterwards. I'm sorry, Lindsay, I got a little long winded there. That was perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so we do have some teachers that have students that are, you know, in coding classes and technology classes. Could you touch on what kind of skills that your office or your position uses um, that would be helpful for resume builders or any of those skills and concepts for young people? Well, the treasurer's office, we deal, deal primarily in money. So accounting is always a great field to have. Um, but we also have uh, an IT department. So somebody that wants to work into, into technology, there's a job here for you. I mean, let's face it, technology and, and this iPhone, as they say, they tell me when I purchase it, it has more computer capacity than NASA, the National Aeronautic Space um, Administration, when they put a man on the moon. This phone has more technology than that computer. So, um, and our, our young people can use these phones better than I'll ever be able to. So just start right there. Um, learn that and it'll take you anywhere you want to go. Excellent. Thank you. I do want to give the opportunity to anybody who would like to ask a question live and unmute. So we'll just take a second and see if we have any brave souls that want to unmute and ask a question. All right, so the last question I have for you is, what would you say your day-to-day -day job looks like, maybe pre-COVID and during COVID? What is the day-to-day -day for the state treasurer? Well, um, COVID has literally turned everybody's lives upside down, um, including mine. I don't call it working from home um, anymore. I call it living at work because it truly has become a 12-hour day and, um, in between a load of laundry, maybe turning on the dishwasher, but there's always something that needs to be done. And that, that has happened. Um, prior to COVID, I think it's, it's just letting the employees, because I have 28 employees, letting them know how much I appreciate them. I'm not in the office 12 days out of every month attending boards and commission meetings that I do. Um, so I've got a deputy treasurer that actually does most of the administrative work and letting him know how much I appreciate him, how much confidence I have in him um, and, and all of my staff. I mean, I have, my assistant is sitting here six feet away from me that has her screen on to help me with these slides. But I texted her at seven o'clock this morning and said, I pretty much changed the entire thing that we wanted to do a week ago 
And are you planning on being at the office this morning or are you working from home? And she said, I'm wherever you want me to be today, Mr. Treasurer. And so she came in this morning and Julie does that and she does that on a regular basis. So um, I'm, I'm just so fortunate pre or past the COVID um, work here is enjoyable. Um, it's challenging, but it's enjoyable because of the people and they all do their jobs and they all do them to help better New Mexico. And when you have that working for you, there's, there's just nothing better. You like going to work in the mornings, Lindsay. Thank you so much for sharing. And we'll, we'll end on that. It's such an important point to know the kind of team you have, and it really does support everything that you're doing. And thank you so much for being here with us today, Treasurer Eichenberg, and sharing your knowledge and your story, and especially your, your children's stories and sharing their uh, journey with benefits. That's really uh, helpful for all the students listening today. So thank you so much. Um, before we log off, just a couple of announcements for everyone on the call. Uh, you will be receiving a post-program mindset survey. Um, and if you complete the survey, you'll be entered into a chance to win a gift card. So please keep filling out those surveys. We pick a new winner each session and we only have two sessions left. So this one and then the next one. So, um, and then finally, our last reminder for our speaker, we do not have one tomorrow at one o'clock. We have one on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. And we will be welcoming Kristen Chavez Smith of the city of Albuquerque. And Kristen will be sharing all the different city services that are provided for youth. So please make sure you keep an eye out for your registration links, as well as uh, your follow-up email that'll be coming to you very soon. And I'll make sure to uh, send the ABLE New Mexico information to our teachers on the call today. Um, so thank you so much, Treasurer Eichenberg. Thank you, Heather. And I hope we all see each other next week as well. Thank you, Lindsay. Be safe. Thank you.